All right, welcome everyone to week 12 review session. Um, this is just going to cover this week's content on DNA replication, error correction, and DNA damage, and then the repair mechanisms that go with DNA damage. Let me get my. Oh, I don't know how to find. Okay, we're just going to go with a pointer. I don't know where the red dot is, but. First section we're going to go into is about DNA polymerase proofreading. So DNA polymerase proofreading, um, it is one of the first parts or first steps, so to say, um, that DNA kind of goes through, that the cell goes through to try and better the error rate. So normally error rate is about one mistake per 10,000, 100,000 nucleotides added. With DNA polymerase proofreading, though, it becomes one mistake per 10 million nucleotides added. So that's definitely really good. Um, and so basically, the additional domain, oh, DNA polymerase proofreading is a additional domain or subunit with DNA exonuclease activity to allow for this proofreading function. So it basically moves the incorrect nucleotide into a separate active site. Um, so I think in the next, let me see, yeah, in the next picture, uh, it'll show a little better how DNA polymerase actually works. But essentially the exonuclease then has three prime to five prime activity. So over here, you can see that this is the template strand in orange and then the red strand is the one that's being built. So building goes five prime to three prime, but the exonuclease say if this one is um, a mismatch or it's not the right nucleotide that was added, it gets put into the active site for the exonuclease um, domain or subunit. And then it chews back um, so it gets rid of that nucleotide and then it, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it removes that nucleotide and then the strand that was incorrect, the new strand goes back into the normal DNA polymerase active site for the right base to be added. Um, and then this also really shows why or hints at why DNA strands are synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, a lot of times people don't understand why am I going the five prime to three prime direction, but it has to do with the phosphodiester bonds. So when you form or when you add the nucleotide bases, um, it's because of that phosphodiester bond, that third phosphate that gets cleaved off and then the energy from that goes on to um, the three prime end. But if you were to say, for instance, make a mistake, now you have to take the three prime end off. And then if you wanted to put in another base, um, it would have to have that third phosphate um, in order for the energy to be added back on. If you are on the five prime end, there is no third phosphate for the energy to make that phosphodiester bond. So it wouldn't work to um, it wouldn't work if you had a mistake. If you had a mistake, there was there would be no way basically to continue replication. So then this is a little better um, description of what I explained before about how, say this is your newly synthesized strand in red. So normally it's going through the active site of the polymerase, but when you're proofreading, if they found that there's a mistake, then it would kind of just be moved into a different active site for the endonuclease or exonuclease site. And then it would chew back that nucleotide and then it would move back into the polymerase active site. And then it would just go back and forth whenever there is a, um, whenever there is a mistake. All right, did that make sense? I know sometimes um, it's a little confusing to think about, but any questions? All right. Okay, cool. So we'll just keep going then. And then the next section is DNA damage and repair mechanisms. So one of the first forms of um, repair mechanisms comes right after replication finishes. So um, proofreading occurs during replication and then mismatch repair or MMR comes right after replication finishes. And this occurs 
to help make the error rate even better. So before it was one mistake per, what was it like 10 million nucleotides, but now it's gonna be one mistake per 1 billion nucleotides. So it really helps decrease that, um, that error rate. And so it is a post DNA replication repair pathway that searches for and fixes base mismatches from DNA replication. So anything that the proofreading function didn't pick up, um, now you've finished replicating, you still have those mismatches, the cell can go in and have this mechanism to try and fix it. And in order to do so, so when you finish replication, obviously you have one strand that is the parent strand and then one strand that is the newly synthesized strand. So in order for this to work, you have to differentiate between the newly synthesized strand and the original parent strand because you don't wanna change or accidentally change the nucleotide on the original parent strand because that's not the one that's mistaken. If you change the one that's mistaken, then any replication that goes on in the future, then it's gonna be like a continuous snowball effect where that mutation or that mistake is going to always be there and it's never gonna be fixed. So you definitely wanna figure out or have a way to figure out which one is the new strand in order to get rid of that, um, the mismatch on that new strand instead of the parent. So this is just like a little gif that I found and it kind of shows um, like a silly way of showing what happens. So like, oh, it sees that this one's wrong. It takes it out and then it puts back in a new one. But there are consequences, like I said. So say for instance, if it does not figure out or if it accidentally did not figure out which one is the new versus the old strand, there's a couple of different consequences that occurs. So if no repair occurs at all, um, basically just like if nothing happens at all, if neither the new one or the parent strand um, gets a different nucleotide repaired, then mismatch pair remains in the DNA and then one daughter cell will have the mutation. So if you think about it, this is the template strand. So it's the correct version. Um, this is going to have in the next round of DNA replication, assuming that a mistake does not occur, um, it'll be correct. But then in the newly synthesized strand where this one was the error and it never got repaired, then in the next round of uh, replication, it's gonna be matched with T. And then obviously that's not the right information that the cell needs or that that's DNA, the DNA needs. Um, but since it wasn't repaired, it's gonna continue to be mismatched or um, erroneous. The second version that could occur is that repair occurs on the parental template strand, which is definitely what we don't want. But if it does happen, then say for instance, over here, A is technically the wrong one that we need to fix. But since the repair occurred on the temple, template strand, the G becomes a T. And so on the next round of replication, both daughter cells are going to have that mutation. So since this was, became a T, then it's going to be paired with A. And then obviously the A was the wrong in the first place and it's going to be paired with T. So either way, both of these are going to be mutated. And then the last version that could occur is what we want to occur, what we want to happen, how mismatch repair should actually happen. And it's that the repair occurs on the newly synthesized strand. So G over here on the template strand is what we want. A is going to be replaced with C through the MMR mechanism. And then in the next round of replication, you have G pair with C and then G pair with C like it's supposed to be. So neither daughter cell is gonna have a mutation at that area. Um, going into kind of just like the mechanism, specifically what happens, um, basically the mismatch regions of DNA are known as lesions or distortions. So if you look at the picture, like this area where it's kind of like this bump, um, those are known as lesions or distortions. And the organisms with MMR mechanism have a protein or proteins to sense, scan, or identify these lesions or distortions. So that way, that's how the cell can kind of like sense or feel that there is something wrong, that something's not pairing correctly. Um, but again, of course, the cell also has to have a way to identify which one is the newly synthesized strand. Um, different organisms have different ways of identifying the new strands. In prokaryotes such as E. coli, D. 
DNA is hemimethylated after replication for a short period of time. So normally in E. coli, um, the E. coli, what E. coli cells do is that they methylate their DNA for different region, reasons, but usually the final outcome is methylated DNA. Newly synthesized or newly replicated DNA though is for about like 20 minutes or so, they're not methylated yet. And so that's how the cell can understand which one's the new one. So obviously the one that is not yet methylated, that's the newly synthesized strand. And then for eukaryotes, it's hypothesized that newly synthesized strands have more NICs, which are areas of the DNA backbone disrupted. So kind of like um, cuts in the DNA backbone basically. And in the parent strand, there definitely would not be any NICs because it's already gone through DNA ligase. DNA ligase has already filled in all the NICs. But for eukaryotes, they hypothesize or they think that when you first synthesize or first newly replicate the DNA, a lot of the NICs are still there because there's like this lag period where DNA ligase doesn't yet go in to fill all in the gaps. So this is a hypothesis though. They don't know for sure. I don't think they've um, actually proved it like ver visually, but this is what um, most scientists have agreed on to be the likely cause. So after you identify the area that the mismatch um, or where the mismatch is, the area around that mismatch has to be removed. And basically the removal area is a chunk of the new strand identification reason, region um, to the DNA mismatch location. So wherever it first, so say for instance, in eukaryotes, um, it identifies the new strand with NICs. So if they first recognize or sense the NIC to be here, it's going to cut all the way from the NIC all the way to where the mismatch actually is. And that's why in MMR, you could possibly have like a lot of, um, nucleotides be extracted. And so from there, the helicase separates the template strand from mismatch strand and the exonuclease removes the erroneous region. So you cut from the NIC all the way to the mismatch and that entire region of, um, of nucleotides gets removed out by the exonuclease. So that now you have kind of this entire large gap um, of missing nucleotides. And because that leaves this section to be a single strand of DNA, the single strand DNA binding protein has to come in and sit on that single strand to kind of stabilize it. And then after that, the sliding clamp and DNA polymerase, since those come as a package deal, they are recruited into this area to fill in the gap. Once that gap is filled in, the DNA ligase comes to seal that last NIC. Um, so obviously the, uh, the three prime end of the new DNA and then the five prime end of the old DNA. So say for instance, if it was uh, replicating this way, then this is the five prime end of what was already synthesized. And then a newly synthesized would have the three prime end and it would fill that NIC or fill that gap in. Um, for prokaryotes, the new strand is also methylated. So Whereas, so in a eukaryote about the NICs, that's for the eukaryotes, the DNA ligase comes in to fill in the NIC, but for prokaryotes, it also has to be methylated. So that's important because it shows that once the DNA strand is methylated, there's no way to tell the difference between which one was the old one and which one was the new one. Or once the NICs are filled in, there's no way to tell the difference between the new and the old strand. So once you can't tell the difference between which one is the new strand and which one's the old strand, MMR cannot continue. So if you can't tell the difference between the two strands, there will be no MMR. All right, any questions about MMR? Okay, we're gonna keep going then. Feel free to stop me or like write in the chat as well as like if you have any questions or you think of any. But in the next section, we're gonna talk about the common types of DNA damage. So this is all gonna be damage that happens to the DNA post replication. So kind of like um, environmental factors and things like that. So it's not intrinsic mistakes that the DNA had during replication. It's gonna be damage that is caused to the DNA. So one of the first 
types of damage um, is a base specific DNA damage, also known as depurination. And depurination is basically when a purine base is removed so that only the backbone remains. That's known as an abasic nucleotide. When you don't have a base, it's an abasic nucleotide. And that is because of some type of spontaneous breakage of that sugar base covalent bond. So if this is your base, oh, sorry, if this is your backbone and then this is your base, there's something that came in to break that covalent bond. And then now um, it's depurinated. As you can see, there's no base here. So now it's abasic. And just something to help you guys remember or know the difference between purines versus pyrimidines. Um, I learned an acronym PAG and pie cut. Um, people have different ways of remembering, but this is how I remember it. So purines are A's and G's or adenines and guanines. And then pyrimidines are um, C's, U's and T's. And then in regards to, say, for instance, you didn't know how an adenine looked like or how a guanine looked like. So purines always have two rings. And I remember it kind of a silly way, but the word purine is shorter than the word pyrimidine. And so it, I think of it as the opposite. So the shorter word has the larger molecule and then the longer word has the smaller molecule. So purines have two rings and then pyrimidines have one ring. But that's just a little trick that I use to remember. Uh, feel free to continue remembering your way if you have a better way. But yeah, this occurs about 5,000 times per cell per day. So it happens pretty often. Um, and so we'll learn about how the cell goes to try and fix it because it can fix it pretty easily. The next form of DNA damage is deamination. And that is basically when it changes specifically a cytosine into a uracil. <clears throat> and because it has different bases, this is obviously bad because if you have a different base, it causes a different base pair in future replication. And then that of course changes the information of the DNA and it might change the structure of the protein and thus the function, um, which of course can affect the organism as a whole. And this is also just a spontaneous oxidative reaction. Basically, you have the carbon nitrogen bond. So a cytosine has this nitrogen. It's attached covalently to this carbon on the sugar backbone. And then an oxidative reaction comes in to um, change this. Sorry, an oxidative reaction comes in to change the Oh, I totally messed that up. It's the carbon between here and then this nitrogen. So the carbon here and then this nitrogen. And then the oxidative reaction causes that NH2 to become an NH3. And then that section just as a whole leaves. And then it changes into a carbon um, double bond O. And then that makes it a uracil. So that occurs about 100 times a day. So less than depurinations, but also pretty often. And then the last form of DNA damage that we talk about in this class is a pyrimidine dimer. These are covalent linkages between adjacent pyrimidines. So usually they are between two thymines, but they can occur between any kind of pyrimidine. Um, so this example here are two thymines. So this is a thymine, and then this is a thymine. But then because of some form of high energy wavelength, such as a UV light, it causes two covalent links, links to form between the two thymines. And then now you have a thymine thymine dimer. And then this becomes a very bulky region of the DNA basically. And it causes a distortion or a lesion in the DNA helix. Um, and because it's so bulky, it's not good because it'll prevent DNA polymerase from being able to replicate or from RNA polymerase to transcribe. Um, since it's so bulky, basically the reason it prevents any of that from happening is because it's too thick to fit through the polymerase's active sites. Um, so it prevents replication or transcription. And then this, of course, is just another reminder to see the difference between purines and pyrimidines. So pyrimidines are smaller. They are only one ring. 
Oh, and then something else um, because of UV light and such like that, that's one of the reasons for um, the main cause behind melanoma, which is a serious form of skin cancer. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the science behind um, certain forms of skin cancer. Okay, I know I kind of messed up that second version. So does anyone have any questions um, or need me to re-explain to clarify? clarify? Okay, I guess we'll just keep going. So now that we learned about the different types of DNA damage, um, we're gonna learn about the primary repair mechanisms for these DNA damages. And one of the first examples is base excision repair or BER. These are used to repair depurinations and deaminations. So these are the ones where the purines are removed and then deaminations are the ones where the cytosines are turned into uracils. And so the first step is for deamination only where it has to identify where the uracil is and then cleave that bond between the sugar and the uracil base so that it forms an abasic nucleotide. This first step is only for deamination because it needs to form this abasic nucleotide in depurination since that purine was, the problem itself was that the purine base is not there. It already is an abasic nucleotide. So it doesn't have to go through this first step. And then the second step and on is gonna be for both depurinations and deaminations. Um, it's going to have two enzymes, AP endonuclease and then phosphodiesterase are gonna come in together to cleave the phosphodiester bonds on either side of the A basic nucleotide. So you can kind of see in this little GIF here, um, if this is the wrong, um, if this is the wrong, sorry, yeah, the wrong nucleotide, first it took away that, or this nucleotide to make it a basic nucleotide. And then the little people come in and cleave both sides of that phos phosphodiester bond. Um, gets rid of that entire section of the DNA backbone. And then a sliding clamp and DNA polymerase come in to fill in that missing nucleotide and DNA ligase comes in to seal those NICs, um, which are basically to make, make those phosphodiester bonds um, so that the DNA backbone is not um, broken or have any breaks in it. This is just an, oh, it's a little blurry, but I hope you guys can see that. Um, but this is just a little more in-depth explanation or depiction of the um, BER mechanism. So if this is the deaminated um, nucleotide, it first has to get rid of that uracil. So now it is an abasic nucleotide. And then the two enzymes come in to cleave that backbone. And now you have this kind of gap in that strand. And then DNA polymerase adds in those nucleotides or that missing nucleotide and DNA ligase comes in to seal it so that the backbone is nice and smooth. And then the second version of repair is called nucleotide excision repair or NER. And basically this repairs the large lesions or distortions in the DNA dimers. Oh, in the DNA, which is an example would be a pyrimidine dimer. So remember the pyrimidine dimers, it has these um, double covalent bonds that causes them to become really bulky, really large, um, just really large lesions that are not good for the cell because it restricts a lot of other mechanisms such as transcription or replication. And so the first step would be to identify the lesion by a protein. It has to figure out where that lesion is. And then those proteins that identify where that lesion is, it also has endonuclease activity. Um, and because of this endonuclease activity, it can nick the DNA on either side of the lesion. And this is usually about 10 to 12 base pairs. So you can see in this picture, um, it's a little bit of a chunk. It's not directly right besides the lesion, but it's also not as large as NMR would be. And so 
the DNA helicase then removes the damaged strand to be degraded. So unlike MMR, which gets chewed back by an exonuclease in an ER, the helicase just takes out that entire piece and then takes it somewhere to be degraded. Um, and then now that you have this chunk of nucleotides missing, again, this is where it gets repetitive, but the sliding clamp and DNA's polymerase comes in to fill the gap. And then DNA ligase seals the last nick in order to make sure that the backbone is nice and smooth. And then just something to think about for maybe like exams or something is if you had a loss of function of the NER, um, does anyone have any idea what would happen if you had a loss of NER? Feel free to, you can unmute yourself if you want or. The, um, so the question is if we have like, so if the, um, the NER can't, cannot take place? Yeah, so like if this entire mechanism doesn't work. Oh, um, then the um, the mismatch will um, remain in place, I think. Like the, the pyrimidine dimer will be in place and then DNA replication wouldn't be able to occur. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, I think someone in the chat also said that the lesions would remain. So because the lesion would remain, kind of to go one step further, you can imagine that you would then have like a really, whoever has a loss of function of NER, um, that person or that organism would have a really high risk of skin cancer because the whole point of, um, one of the primary causes of skin cancer are these dimers. And because of these dimers, and if you can't repair the dimers, you have a really high risk of skin cancer. And um, those people have to be really careful and protected from the sun um, or just any uh, interaction with UV rays or powerful wavelengths. Um, that disease is actually called exerodoma, X-E-R-O-D-E-R-M-A, pigmentosum. So there is a disease called that where it has no NER function, um, and it just makes them really at high risk for skin cancer. So any questions about NER or BER? All right, looks good. We'll just keep going. Okay, so moving on to double-stranded breaks, I think this is our last section. Um, from this week's content, but double-stranded breaks occur when both strands of a piece of double-stranded DNA are broken. So, so far we've kind of been learning about only that newly synthesized strand being um, mistaken, or there's only one nucleotide that was um, mismatched or something like that. But double-stranded breaks are when both strands are affected and both strands of the DNA are broken. And this is commonly because of some type of high energy particle or wavelength assault on that DNA. So it can also be because of UV rays, UV lights, um, ionizing radiation, or any other um, environmental factors such as that. And these can also be caused by unrepaired lesions. So if because of UV rays, you had a lesion um, such as pyrimidine dimers, but then that dimer was never repaired, then it can cause both strands of that DNA to be broken. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. And so it can also disrupt genes and or cause chromosomal rearrangements. And then that will in turn result in the cell to have a programmed cell death, or it can also lead to cancer. And so there are two different ways to repair double-stranded breaks. It can either be non-homologous end joining, NHEJ, or it can be homology directed repair. And different organisms use these two repair mechanisms at different rates. For instance, E. coli and yeast use HDR a lot more, but in humans, we use NHEJ, NHEJ a lot more. So going into a little more specific about the mechanism, um, this is kind of a general outline. We don't go that much in detail about the mechanism in this class, but the general idea of this process is that the cell identifies where the broken blunt ends of the DNA are. So where these breaks um, in the double, where the double-stranded break is. 
And then it processes those ends with an exonuclease. So see how these are kind of like sticky ends where they're not entirely even. So an exonuclease comes in and chews back at those ends until they are even. Um, and then the ends are then joined together by a lot of a large complex of proteins. And that's called DNA ligation. And then that's what causes both strands to be um, not broken and both strands to be repaired. And this is a really quick and efficient way of fixing double, brand, double breaks in humans, especially. And that's probably why um, in humans, we use this because humans have a lot of genes that don't really code for anything. So it's okay if the exonucleases um, chew back on nucleotides and we miss some nucleotides um, because there's a higher chance for those nucleotides have not really mattered and to not really be that important. But yeah, so NHEJ occurs when there's no other complementary DNA strand that the cell can use to repair with. Um, so a pro of that would be homologous strands are not required. And since they're not required, any double-stranded break can be repaired quickly by NHEJ. But since there is no homologous strand, um, you might not have the perfect match, so to say. And then again, the use of exonucleases causes a lot of loss of nucleotides. And so information can be lost. Um, that's why E. coli and yeast you don't really use this mechanism because a lot of their genes, um, since they have less, it all of their genes or a lot of their genes do code for something and it would be kind of detrimental for that organism um, if some of those nucleotides are lost and that they don't have the right nucleotides to replace them. So on the flip side, homology, di homology directed repair is the process in which DNA repair template is used to perfectly repair the double-stranded break. So in this one, there is a template that comes in and basically the homologous recombination or breakage induced replication can be used. These are just different mechanisms, but you don't need to know specifically um, kind of like the steps or anything like that that goes into each one. <laughs> But the general outline over here is that you have uh, a D loop invasion. Oh, well, first that there's this break and then this is the correct template that it's going to use. And then this is known as a D loop invasion because it kind of looks like a D, I guess. But the part of the broken strand will go into or break up the one that was correct um, and then it'll start to base pair that way. Um, it'll base pair between the broken strand and the homologous strand until it fulfills all of the nucleotides that it needs. And then it'll kind of go back into its own strand and be, um, and be all patched up so that there is no more broken strand. And so because there is a template in this process, cells prefer HDR if it's available because it causes a lot less errors. You're not losing as much information, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's definitely a pro. They're, they're not exactly changing the sequence, but in a con, um, you have to have that double-stranded version of the broken DNA. Um, in humans, that's why HDR isn't really used that much because most cells are not dividing. Most of our cells um, and our body are no longer in that dividing state. And so there most likely will not be um, the availability of a repair template. So we just go straight for NHEJ, which just kind of cuts back and then fills it in, but hope, and then just hope that um, whatever it filled in wasn't too detrimental. So that was the end of it. Is there any questions about anything that we covered? Anything that you guys want me to clarify? If not, thank you guys for coming and you can always reach out to me through email if you have further questions later on. I just have a question real quick. Yeah, of course. Um, what like is the main difference you um, be between NH, EJ and HDR? Cause you were saying it, I just didn't like get it. So oh yeah, no worries go over that again. So NHEJ does not have a template. So see how over here HDR has this extra template. 
um, NHEJ does not have that. Instead, what it'll do is that an exonuclease will come in and just chew back on both ends. Um, and then a protein complex that's not specified, you don't really need to know what specifically comes in, but a protein complex comes in to fill up that gap. So in HDR though, you have this, um, you have this template strand available and that's what allow it, will allow it to have more precise base pairing activity. Um, in, whereas in NHEJ, it's not um, for certain, it's not for certain or ensured that you're going to have the exact same base pairing that you had in the original. Does that make yeah. a lot more sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Of course, no problem. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.